Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Good evening. You are tuned to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very exciting campus that we call Montana State University and coming to you over your Montana public television system. I'm Jack Reisman, retired professor of plant pathology. I'll be your host this evening. Those of you who have watched the program in the past know how this works. All you have to do is provide questions, comments, and we will get them on the air to the best of our ability. Without your questions and comments, this show can be plenty boring, but you can make it entertaining with some of your questions that challenges our esteemed panel this evening. This evening's panel I'll introduce here in just a moment. Starting off way on my left is Yuda McKelvey. Yuda is our new plant pathologist, hired full-time just this past year. Welcome on board. She's very knowledgeable, so if you have any questions concerning plant diseases, uh, call them in tonight. We'll challenge her, make her think a little bit. Our special guest this evening, Patty Fleming. Patty is the director of Montana Extension Manufacturing Center. Patty's been here before one other time, but a lot of people don't realize that the Extension does have a manufacturing center and they help fledgling industries make it most of the time, we hope. But if you have questions about how industries start in the state, especially ag industries, good chance to ask those questions this evening. Joel Schumacher. Joel, welcome back. Joel is an economist, ag economist for Extension Service here at MSU. Very knowledgeable, labor problems, lots of other economic questions that you may have, he can definitely answer this evening. And Mr. Dynamic. Dave Bombar, he's a horticulturalist this evening, and I know if you have questions about horticulture, any of the plants that you try to grow here in the state of Montana, uh, good chance to ask those questions this evening. And I do want to mention that we have had a minor challenge with snow here in the Gallatin Valley this past couple of days, and we have one question that came in, I'll get to Dave in a moment. But we've had about 20 to 24 inches of snow throughout the valley, not out by Three Forks, not out by Manhattan. But from Belgrade on into Bozeman, it has been dynamic. One of the best snowfalls I've seen in a long time. Answering the phone this evening is Deanna Midland. She's here in the studio. Deanna, thanks for being here. And Judge Booth Lobel is taking calls remotely. So keep that phone ringing. We'll have the phone number up here in a moment, and then we'll start answering those questions. Patty, tell us about your operation. Sure, Jack. So 1996, uh, Dr. Bob Taylor in the College of Engineering started the Montana Manufacturing Extension St Center. He got it approved by the Board of Regents and the legislature. It uh, is partially funded by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, partially funded by the Montana legislature, and then the remaining part of our budget we have to make up by charging our customers for our fees. When we started in 1996, there were about 1,500 manufacturers in the state of Montana. As of uh, this year, we are at about 4,500. So we've seen amazing growth in manufacturing. We have a staff of about 13 right now with offices spread around the state. We're loosely based on the ag extension model, except that we do have to charge for our services. And rather than help uh, farmers and ranchers, we help manufacturing. And if you talk about uh, the definition of manufacturing, that's where you take something physical and you do something to it that changes its value. And that's called manufacturing. So in manufacturing, we have basically two different types. You can call one of them value-added mining and the other one is value-added ag. You know, I like the term value-added ag. And a lot of people 
probably understand a little bit that you take a basic commodity and add value to it. Give us some examples of how that's worked here in the state of Montana. Sure, we had lots of great examples going back to uh, Wilcoxon's ice cream, to uh, Wheat Montana, to High Country Beef Jerky. Uh, recently we have uh, 41 grains out of SCOBY that just won an award. Uh, they're taking uh, pulse crops and making flour. Uh, chickpea flour out of it. So uh, anything that we grow or produce on a farm or ranch in the state, if we can add some value to it and get it to the market, we not only help the farmer that grew it, we get the profit there, but also we get the profit for the processing of it. Okay. So why I have you up, the Department of Ag, Montana Department of Ag has innovation grants and so forth. Does your operation interact a lot with the Department of Ag in this particular arena? We sure do. The, those are called uh, value-added ag producer grants. Uh, there's also uh, USDA puts those out. So does Montana Department of Ag. Uh, these are f uh, fantastic opportunities for somebody to do a feasibility study. I believe most of them go up to about $50,000 available. And, the, and the, uh, the state or the USDA will pay half of that. And that way you can have a study done to uh, determine whether putting a meat processing plant on your ranch is a good idea and we'll pencil out in the next few years. So we, we are often paid to do the study ourselves. Okay, thank you. Um, I neglected to say early on that we do take questions via email. I haven't seen our phone number up on the screen yet, so that will be up shortly. And we also take questions through um, Facebook or Meta. So those are your chances to send in questions and we can go that route. Now, I have one that is very pertinent for Dave. And this came in via email this week. And it reads, do I have to mention I am sick of snow? And every year this person tries to start plants indoors, I assume vegetables and tomatoes and so forth, but without not much success. Any suggestions on improving that operation? So probably the most important thing that you can do is to improve the quality of light. And so having a south facing window is nice, but most modern houses have low E glass so that blocks some of the light coming in. So it's, it's really challenging to have enough light. And so fortunately, um, LED horticultural lighting's made some great strides, um, mostly thanks to the cannabis industry. Um, but anyhow, there's some really good lights out there. Um, they, they give you um, the ideal spectrum for plant growth. And more importantly, they don't give off a lot of waste heat, so they can be um, positioned fairly close to the plants. And so uh, a, a grow cart that has multiple trays, uh, multiple shelves with a couple different levels of light, you can grow some really nice plants. So that's probably the, like the number one thing you can add to uh, improve the success of your garden starts is improving the light quality okay. and quantity. Do you have a price range for the cart that you just mentioned? for something of that dimension? So just like a lot of things, uh, you get what you pay for, and it's sometimes confusing when you look online to compare different light fixtures because they'll use different units as far as what the intensity is, mm -hmm. and some of the units are confusing. So you'll see like Lux, which is kind of an old-fashioned unit. Modern plant uh, physiologists talk about micromoles per meter squared per second, which is a a very odd thing to like, talk about with just lay folks, but typically like the higher the number and if the spectrum is designed, and a lot of these lights have this kind of purple glow because plants respond photosynthetic, photosynthetically most to red and blue light. Um, but um, so those are the things. So getting uh, the most output in the appropriate spectrum. You know, bring up an interesting point. Every year, about this time, but not this year, you see all these plants being sold at our big box stores and various other places that are produced out of state mm -hmm. or maybe with contracted greenhouses in the state. Patty, is there a potential for growing, or somebody starting a business in growing transplants like tomatoes, peppers, and being relatively successful, and would that be something you would work with? Yes, absolutely. I also think there's a huge opportunity, a lot of people are taking advantage of this right now, is fresh cut flowers. Okay. 
you know, and boy, they're not cheap. <laughs> I think that's why it started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, from Helena, uh, Joel, what is driving all the interest in local foods? Any idea there? Oh, we've seen a bunch of things over the last few years. I mean, this was growing before the pandemic, but certainly the pandemic had some sort of um, constraints on supply in general. So they're kind of looking at, you know, like, you can't get beef at the store. Is there a local option? So I think that was part of it was just being able you could source that product. Um, but there's also been sort of um, kind of a local economic development um, story, kind of like Patty was talking about with some of his businesses, that it's just an opportunity to capture more of that here. Um, so that's been going on. And also, you know, Montana's population is growing. Um, and has been, so that gives a little more dynamic, you know, you got a little few more customers which might cut your transportation costs that might make some of those businesses more more viable, you know, in Montana compared to years past. Okay. Uh, Uta, uh, I have several questions, some from last week, some from this week, and also from emails. A lot of the spruce trees and pine trees uh, people are seeing in their yards and shelter belts are showing some brown needles. They want to know why. Some people think it's a disease, others think it's <laughs> environmental. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions there? Yeah, so I mean, you know, browning could be due to a lot of reasons, but something that I've noticed a lot in the, this past week before it became winter again is um, what, I call, what we call winter injuries. So over the winter, um, conifers still have needles, so green tissue, so they still do photosynthesis, and so um, they can literally dry out, and that can cause a browning of the needles. And one way to maybe discern that from a disease is that um, this browning, oh yeah, like shown in this picture here, that's something that I took um, earlier this week. Uh, so you see those brown needles, and the browning is typically on the south, southwest side of the tree, where they get the most sunlight, and um, yeah, so some, so it's um, unless it's really bad, it's not going to kill the plant. Something to help prevent this is um, watering the, the tree throughout the season and well into the fall to make sure that they have adequate soil moisture throughout the winter. That just helps the plant. Okay, good advice. Uh, question from last week that I kind of jumped around and didn't answer very well. This person wants, wanted to know, will the panel from last week share the recipes mm. that we showed on TV with the various pulse crops. And we will be doing that. They've been accumulated. And if you look at aglive at montanapbs.org, over the next several days, those recipes should be up. And over the next couple of weeks, we will have the aglive newsletter back up and they will also be in there. Speaking of vegetables, Tomatoes. This person from Whitefish would like to know the difference between determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. So there's obviously lots of different types of tomatoes out there, but probably the first kind of segregation is determinate versus indeterminate. And um, so determinate tomatoes um, grow to a certain height. They set all their uh, blooms approximately at the same time and the fruits already. And so determinant tomatoes are good ones to choose if you're uh, gardening outside um, and you don't want to deal with uh, excessive trellising or we have a really short season. So most of these uh, varieties that are developed for cold climates, short season tomatoes are determinant. Um, if you have some protection like a high tunnel, greenhouse, hoop house, something like that, an indeterminate tomato grows until frost kills it or the grower stops growing it. And so in, in like the um, um, thoroughbred tomatoes grown in, in fully controlled greenhouses, you know, those plants will go 30 feet. And so, um, and they can, a good grower can produce 60 pounds of tomatoes from a plant. Wow. Um, but it takes a lot of infrastructure and trellising and mm -hmm. fertility to do something like that. Bottom line for Montana, determinant tomatoes are the choice for yes, most people. For most yeah. people, yeah. Patty, are there any um, what you call hydroponic greenhouses still producing in the state that you're aware of? I'm sure there are, but I do not know. Do we Joel have, probably knows Joel? more. Yeah, we were at the Capitol this week, and they, they had some lettuce from one of them, but I can't remember the provider that had them up, but it was Montana-grown lettuce. There used to be a, a, a lettuce grower in Big Timber, but I'm not sure they're still there. But. So there's a pretty good size firm in the Bitterroot. Yes, out of Hamilton called Local Bounty. So yeah, they're doing salad mix and things like that. Fully so, automated. 
Yeah, pretty impressive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like those kind of local industries that provide fresh produce for the state of Montana. Mm -hmm. It really works well. And it might be a little more pricey, but in reality, sometimes the flavor makes up for it, definitely. Um, question from Billings for Patty. Are there any new meat processing facilities in Montana? And if not, why are there not new ones? There are lots, and I can ask my friend Joel to pipe in here too, but uh, boy, some that I can name off the top of my head is I know there's a new one at Malta. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a talk of a tribal one on Fort Belknap. Yep. Uh, there's a new nonprofit one at Livingston, which is an interesting model. Um, the other thing I'd say over the last couple of years, the state has put a lot of grants into helping current processors expand. So. You know, the numbers might be the same. They're doing more animals per week, so that's added a lot um, yes. to lots and, I mean, dozens of our current processors expanded in the last few years. But, you know, and I wonder if the caller might be wondering if, if it's a, any big processors. And we do not have any big processors at this point. So, so what factors limit the ability for a small meat processing facility to develop here in the state? I would say the, one of the first things is uh, HACCP, which is their food safety, is the biggest hurdle to get over. Uh, having an adequate and reliable supply, you know, five animals a week, doesn't just happen overnight. It's got to be staged out, and you have to have the supply chain figured out. Uh, otherwise, you're sitting around for two weeks waiting for animals to be finished. So. Yeah, good point. I think labor's, How about labor? been, a big, yeah, labor's labor. been a challenge. You know, a lot of the meat processing plants are not zero skilled jobs, um, but they're um, also jobs that a lot of times are sourced from within the community and they're, they're not immune from the labor shortages we've had either. So depending where you're at, might be a little better or worse, but if they had more labor, they could probably do more processing. Okay. We should probably add with that too that Miles, City Col uh, Miles Community College has implemented a meat cutting program that is doing very well and helping a lot of these processors out. That's great. And maybe we can get somebody from there to talk about that on the yeah. program sometime. Good information. Uh, you there. This person from Belgrade has noticed they have vertical cracks in their maples and to a lesser degree in their ash. Any idea what might be causing that? Mm, that sounds like uh, frost cracks. Also something that I've seen a lot this winter and um, so what frost cracks are is what the name implies so if we have like very extreme temperature changes from really cold to really warm which probably sounds familiar to most people watching from Montana this essentially you know causes the water in that's in the tree trunk to expand form ice which makes the cells disrupt and so that's literally what the cracks are uh, they can be pretty superficial they can go deep if it's happening over years uh, so it's definitely something to check out if there is decay with your, uh, where the cracks are. Certain trees are more susceptible to that than other trees. Um, and then something, that, and I think younger trees too, and something that you can do to protect the tree is um, to put like a, I, I forgot the name, but like a tree guard or something around them, but really only in the fall and throughout the winter, they're typically white to kind of deflect the sunlight. And so it keeps the temperatures a little bit more stable. And another trick with the tree guards, and they're plastic, if you've got young trees, you want that tree guard right down at soil level because mm -hmm. as soon as the snow melts, you're going to know that we've had a real vole problem yeah. in the state this year. Yeah. And they will girdle young two-inch diameter fruit trees. So mm -hmm. get that guard right down mm -hmm. on the soil That's ground. They'll girdle six inch diameter. Ten you have <laughs> <laughs> I lost 30 trees a couple winters. 30 apple I trees. I remember that. Yeah. And they were they, they, stripped of the bark a foot off the soil surface. And they don't recover. No. 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 Uh, Patty, um, what is the MSU Manufacturing Center doing to help the industrial hemp growers to make it more profitable. And that call came in from Great Falls. Well, we offer our uh, typical services, which include uh, growth, innovation, and profit enhancement to uh, all manufacturers, including the hemp growers. Uh, we also uh, offer that to the cannabis growers as well. Uh, in, the, in the hemp market, I think there's uh, market conditions and market drivers that are hurting them more than anything. I think uh, 
just my opinion, Joel can weigh in here too, that I think that uh, the CBD uh, oil uh, craze is pretty much over. And I think that now people need to focus on what we can do with the fiber instead of working with the oil. You know, do you have any idea, are we still growing a fair amount of hemp in the state? Actually, I don't know. I, it, I don't know the acreage. Joel, though. have you had any clue? I didn't see the 22 numbers, um, but there were still certainly some. I think Fort Benton has some of the processing going on there. Okay. Um, it'd be nice if we could get another profitable crop yeah. in the state. Mm -hmm. and. Now hopefully, over time, we'll find that we'll be profitable. So I'm curious about the CBD oil. What do you think's caused the decline in it? This is the, there's not a market demand or there's yeah, overproduction? I just think there's not a market demand as much as they expected it to be. Mm. Okay. You, know, you have a little book there. Uh, yeah. Keep looking over there and see what it is. Why don't you show the audience what it is? Yeah, so I brought with me the Montana Scouting Guys for Trees and Shrubs, and um, it's been out for probably two years now, but I just wanted, you know, we're all hopeful that spring is really around the corner, and so this is a really neat resource where you can um, browse for um, actually what kind of trees are growing in Montana and shrubs, what diseases, insect issues, and abiotic issues such as frost cracks. Um, appear and um, so just a reminder that we have that resource and uh, you can uh, find it in the MSU uh, publications store um, so it's just um, MSU extension publication or MS I MSU extension.edu now yeah right and then so you just search for the uh, publication store and they should have some there we're okay. trying to make sure that there's constant supply sounds good uh, this is interesting. I'm curious about this for myself. Caller from Helena would like to know about the most unusual or surprising manufacturing projects that the manufacturing guest has worked with. Now, I, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of them that we can't talk about on TV. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so let's put those away. Uh, boy, I, I'd have to, you have to come back to me. Well, you think about that and we'll come back. And uh, a comment from Laurel uh, it says, Hydroponic Roots, Swanky Roots, is a company out of Laurel, Montana that they wanted to share. So that answers some of the questions there. Uh, this is a caller from Swan Lake, and I'm not sure, Joel, you might want to take this one. And it says, did the state ever come to a decision on a slaughterhouse for a state? I think at one point, wasn't there supposed to be a there's been a couple larger scale studies to see if the state could support one, um, but that wasn't going to be a direct state investment. So the feasibility studies were done, um, and the information is publicly available. One of them's on the One Montana um, site is where you can access one of them. But it kind of seems to me the way the market's been going here in the state the last few years, it's been additional small processors and our current small processors expanding. All right. Thank you. Um, Dave, you can do this one from Helena. Boy, a lot of questions from Helena tonight. It must be nice up there, not snowing. Uh, pruning apple trees. The ground is still frozen. Is it too late or too early to prune? And is it too early to spray with the dormant oil? Uh, no, it's a good time to prune, and it's a good time to treat with dormant oil. Yeah, up until when? Um, you want to have both of those operations done before you have bud break. Yep. All right. Uh, from Great Falls, this caller would like to know, are there any mobile meat processors in the Great Falls area or anywhere else in the state? And I think there is one, but you guys can jump on that. Yeah, I can start off. But, uh, there are mobile units you can buy and several Groups have bought them in Montana, uh, but moving them is not an easy task with hooking up to septic and water and all that. So as far as I know, the, one, the mobile units that have been bought for Montana, in Montana, are not being moved. Is that sure. correct? Yeah, that's true what I'd say. And, and you know what we see sometimes too is um, an animal will be taken in and, and the slaughter will take place at a licensed facility and then the carcass half whole 
quarters can be sent further. So sometimes we see kind of some mobile things happening that way where you don't have the whole slaughter plant, but you're buying, might even be your animal or using it, but it was taken to a licensed slaughter facility, but then you did the further processing somewhere else. Okay. Um, this is an email question um, from Manhattan. The aspen leaves are still on the tree this spring. Mm. Of course, they're desiccated. Why didn't they drop off? You, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, we had a pretty sudden start of winter, like pretty sudden temperature drops, and that essentially disrupted the normal process that plants or trees go through to kind of uh, mature the leaves and then drop them. And so the leaves just stayed on, brown and dead, and um, shouldn't do any harm to the trees. And it's, um, you know, with the wind over the winter or now or at the last, you know, now when it's hopefully finally spring and the new leaves are budding, that should push out or push off or drop the, the She's final so leaves. so optimistic. Then... Now that it's spring. <laughs> I, I got to cling to something. It's got to be there. It's going to be there. Somebody yeah. has to be optimistic here. <laughs> it's just another um, month it, or it, so. It is a late spring, I'll <laughs> say that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've had several questions about skunks and voles and everything else. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have Steve Van Tassel from the Montana Department of Agriculture. And he's our critter guru, so we'll answer all those questions when he's on that evening. Uh, Dave, uh, from Plains, last fall they had a load of three tons of topsoil to fill a gully, and they see now that that ground is full of clay. They're not about to move the topsoil, so I think they got clay instead. They want to know what plants will grow well in clay. Tough question. It is a tough question. You know, there's that old, there's a Japanese proverb, where there's clay, there is hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, probably the best thing to do is to think about what can you do to amend even like the top two, three, four inches to improve the water infiltration into that clay and to avoid the cracking, the shrink, shrinking and swelling that they're going to do. So compost, um, things like that would help greatly. And then other than that, um, a lot of plants will actually do fine there. The big challenge, of course, then is water management, mm. making sure that you have adequate water but not too much and that maybe it's ideal for a drip system so that you can you know, slow the rate of, of the application of the water so it's time to infiltrate and not just run off the surface. But I think the first thing I would do before I planted anything was to improve the porosity and, you know, the temptation is sand. Oh, just dump a bunch of sand on top. <laughs> and it's really, really challenging because it takes a lot of sand. Sand doesn't create that big a particle. So actually, I think compost, um, manure sources that you know are free of herbicide residues or manure mixed with straw and get that incorporated in the top few inches, that'll go a long way to help. Okay. Thank you. Patty from Butte, um, interesting question. This person knows that there are a ton of uh, microbreweries in the state, and you mentioned earlier you did work with a lot of them. They want to know about the sudden onset of distillers. Are you working with distillers here in the state? We are as well, yes. I would say there's, pro there's well over 100 brewers in the state right now, and I think there's probably 30 distillers at, right now. 80? 30. 30, okay. And big ones in, uh, in the works. Uh, there's one that's being planned right now at Power, Montana, that's supposed to be very large. So are we consuming all this in the state, or are we shipping it out? We're shipping it out. In fact, a few of the distillers are contract manufacturing uh, base alcohol. Okay. That is then aged, given to other uh, distilleries that age it and, and market it. How do they ship that out of the state, out of curiosity? I haven't asked, but I would assume they're probably leave a, uh, I don't know. Sorry. I don't either. Casts, or probably in some wooden well, casts. I would say probably in stainless steel yeah. tanks. Okay, stainless steel tanks. Good what's, to know. What's the feedstock they're using for that? Where are they making it from? Uh, mostly uh, barley. Barley, okay. As the barley acres increased, I mean, the uh, distilleries have increased, do you think the barley acres would really be increasing in the state? I haven't heard from that. Um, you don't know. I haven't seen any big trends in barley. Trend. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the price of barley is quite strong yeah, the, now? The prices have been pretty good the last few years for, you know, a number of crops. So 
Yeah, could be a good time to have some barley. Okay. Okay. Um, so for the control panel, this person would like to see the phone numbers for the panelists because they would like to contact Dave and Joel because they want to pick your brains a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So well, we'll that get take that too up. long. No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mr. Mr. Lively here, that's good. Uh, caller from Northern Wyoming, and thank you down in Wyoming for watching. They have a slug issue. They had slugs eat on their potatoes last year. How do you deal with this in the future? You want to handle the slugs? You can drown them in beer. I know that. Mm -hmm. well, you, you, <laughs> That's the waste. <laughs> so the question is, like, the habitat that you yeah. create for slugs. And, you know, I haven't experienced a lot of slug issues when I grow outside. I've had slug issues when I grow in the greenhouse or the high tunnel, especially if I'm utilizing like a plastic uh, mulch where you have this really high moisture and they're able to come out of the plastic mulch at night and then feed on the crops. So I guess I'm wondering about moisture management yeah. if Thank they're you. creating conditions that are going to favor those slugs. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, there are mollusk sides available, so, um, but I'm not familiar what's labeled for use on potato. And I have no really idea what the economics on that one would be. I think you, you nailed it. It's moisture. But that brings back a story on this program many, many years ago. Sue Blodgett, who was an entomologist at the time, ran across a study where a graduate student, I think at South Dakota State University, or might have been Kansas State, one of those two, did a taste test with beer to see which beers were most effective in controlling <laughs> slugs. And the most successful was Coors, banquet beer. <laughs> so, you know, grad students will go to all kinds of lengths to have certain types of projects. I just remembered that after your explanation. Okay. Uh, Back to you, the Belgrade caller has several trees, including mountain ash, which have brown leaves still attached. Are these trees in trouble, and is there anything they should do to help the trees? You partially answered that earlier. I don't think they're in trouble, do you? No, I, do, I don't think so. I, I guess, I mean, I would start being concerned when all the other trees have green leaves, and then you still have the brown leaves from last year. <laughs> other yeah. than that, yeah. It's probably okay. the same issue that we discussed before, yeah, I, that the I winter agree. came too sudden. And we, it's not leaving, but it will. <laughs> they'll fall here. And actually, the last few windstorms we had, I've lost a lot of leaves mm -hmm. off my aspen. Yeah. And it, it looks funny when you've got leaves all over the top of your white snow. Yeah. Um, and one, is, th one issue that I observed, because I have that in my aspen trees in my backyard, too, um, you know, they have more surface, so you capture more snow. So, like, one potential issue is that you just have more branches breaking from the snow. And I definitely had that happen, so I have to deal with the branches that are somewhere up in the crown now, broken off. They'll okay. come down eventually. <laughs> <laughs> um, question for Patty from Missoula. This came in via email. And this person says they love lamb, but they have never seen the product sold in stores with Made in Montana on it. Mm -hmm. Most of the lamb they get is from Down Under. I think that's correct. Why isn't Montana looking at lamb as a regional industry here? And, and Joel, you can jump in too. I'm the Joel and take the first part. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I'd say if you're just trying to flat out find some local lamb, a lot of the meat processors actually buy animals, both beef and lamb, and you have a meat counter right at the processing plant. And you can go in, you don't have to buy a whole lamb, but you can buy particular cuts. So if you're having trouble sourcing it, um, and obviously if you get it at the local processor, you know it came from, you know, Montana. Grocery store options, you know, I'm sure they do have the choice whether to get an international product or out-of-state product um, or a local product here. But um, lamb numbers in Montana have been, you know, generally on the decline for the last decade, but maybe more stabilizing. So certainly there's plenty of potential to grow lamb here if there's a market for it. You know, I read an interesting article that the average annual per capita consumption of lamb is, anybody want to guess? 0.7 pounds mm. per person. And I do that in one sitting. Mm. I mean, I like <laughs> lamb. So anyway, <laughs> enough I, said there. And Jack, I would say too that, you know, speaking of the uh, sheep industry though, a good, uh, good point uh, in this is uh, the amount of wool that's being uh, processed right now, especially uh, by John Helley out of Dillon, Dillon, that's being used as Duckworth 
uh, products. Uh, so that's a good sign for mm-hmm. wool production in He's, Montana. That process or his operation has really taken off. I mean, he runs a large number of sheep, and their product is recognized nationwide. It's a great product. We've had John on the program okay. one time. Very, very knowledgeable. Uh, from Lewistown, this caller is a Pennsylvanian transplant who used to attend Pennsylvania farm, fruit, and garden conferences and take classes on ag and garden topics. Does Montana have similar conferences or places to attend similar classes? Yeah, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, We have uh, the Montana Master Gardener Program, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, The MSU Extension IPM Program is hosting uh, several workshops and other educational events throughout the year. Um, One that might be of interest is... um, we usually have it in the fall. It's called Turf to Tree Workshop. That's targeting the uh, green industry, but also, you know, just interested people from the general public. And then I think there are several associations in Montana that, you know, you could consult. Some One that comes to mind is AMTOP. I'm actually not sure what, yeah. or what the acronym is. Association of are. Turf and Ornamental Professionals. And then there's there also the Montana Nursery Association, and their mm-hmm. meeting typically is in the first week of January, and it typically bounces mm-hmm. between Missoula and Billings. And so, we also have a Master Gardener, very active Master Gardener program yeah. in mm-hmm. the state. So if I wanted to find out about these extension egg and Great garden question. programs, where would I go to look? Thank you for that question. So the MSC Extension pro, uh, IPM program has a website that's associated with MSC Extension. So Montana, oh, sorry, Joel, help me out again. <laughs> uh, MSUExtension.edu. The new address, and then I think it's just slash IPM. Yeah. Okay, uh, Joel from Red Lodge. This person would like to know: Did Montana lose workers during the pandemic? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you certainly have probably seen help wanted signs everywhere. Montana mm-hmm. was one of the states that was an exception. We've got about twenty thousand more people working in Montana than we had prior to the pandemic, um, which is ranks us, you know, relatively near the top third of states in terms of gained workers over the last couple of years. Um, but kind of an interesting point, this isn't because a higher percentage of Montanans went to work. It's because a lot of people became Montanans and moved to Montana during the last couple of years. So that's how we've grown our workforce is primarily because of all the folks that have moved to Montana in the last couple of years. You know, before the program, I asked these two gentlemen, what would happen if we had zero percent Unemployment, which we'll never get to. We're at 2.4% for the state right now. But at 0% unemployment, would we still be short of workers? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we've got a major issue in this state. What, you know, one thing that's kind of addressing that is the Montana Department of Commerce has just initiated uh, 0% loans to manufacturers for automation mm-hmm. to try to... Uh, Create, free up uh, existing employees to work on other things by automating uh, dull, mundane, and mm-hmm. backbreaking work. Okay, thank you. Uh, from White Sulphur Springs, we don't get a lot of calls from White Sulphur, so thank you for the inquiry. This is for the panel. With the closing of sugar plants in Sydney, what will farmers grow instead in the far eastern part of the state? And next week we'll address that too with um, the director of Montana Department of Agriculture. But you guys jump on it too. Joel, you probably know best. Well, one thing I just say about this, the plant in Sydney, um, which is different than the sugar plant in Billings, is um, you know they send contracts out just like barley dealers every year, and they were contracting. And the number of acres they had had had, had shrunk a lot in the last decade, um, just across the board. And I think a lot of that was economic reasons for the growers that they already had other crops that were better in their rotations. Um, so I think you're going to see more of a lot of the crops we have so you know some pulses maybe a little bit of corn and soybeans even out in that lower part of the state there Um, but you know just the traditional crops I think are going to suck up those acres and again we're talking about probably less than 25,000 acres that had been in sugar beets out there Um, and some of those acres were actually on the North Dakota side of the border too so they weren't even all in Montana so so and with today's corn yields and we can grow corn for grain out in the um, Sydney area Mm -hmm. um can we get 200 bushel corn out there right at it? <laughs> I don't know if we can get to 200, but uh, we can probably get a lot better than we were doing 
10 years ago. Ten years the varieties ago. have gotten a lot better for those shorter season. Um, and I think just across the nation, you've seen the corn planted acreage shift north and west over the last it 20, has. 25 years as the varieties have become more suited towards growing in places like that lower Yellowstone River. Um, and, and a lot of North Dakota, you know, has made a transition towards corn. You know, you're an economist. I sit back and I look at what alfalfa is selling for right now. And we can grow five, six ton alfalfa pretty reasonably mm -hmm. without a lot of inputs. Where does alfalfa compete with, say, sugar beets or mm -hmm. corn? You know, it certainly could come in. You know, obviously a lot of those sugar beets were grown on irrigated acres. So the right. other crops that we're primarily are going to be considering replacing are other crops that do well in an irrigated conditions and hay is certainly one whether that's alfalfa um, you know but also we have irrigated barley in places in the state so those are going to be kind of the you know I th I'd say the go-to crops um, to start with and corn being the other one okay Matty I go back a long ways in the state we used to have a processing facility I think it was at Miles City that took alfalfa and made little like shredded Cubes. wheat biscuits out of them and shipped them all over do we have any exported alfalfa products that you're aware of, of businesses in the state? I'm not aware of anything that's processed. I think it's all going out as baled. Okay. Yeah, a lot of it goes out as baled. There's no doubt about that. Uh, from Clyde Park, this person wants to start an asparagus bed, and they want to know should they start with seeds or should they start with roots? It's all yours. So you can do either. The problem with seed started asparagus is that it's going to be four, five, six years before you harvest. So if you start with roots you'll, or crowns, um, you'll cut that in half. And so uh, I'd be tempted, unless there's some variety. So the only time I really recall doing um, asparagus from seeds when we were doing uh, heirloom varieties for the Tinsley House. So those old-fashioned varieties that were grown in the 1800s weren't available. But you could still buy seeds for them. They weren't available as crowns. And so, um, yeah, you're probably better off. Unless you're really patient, then you're better off to get, get roots. <laughs> yeah, roots are the way to go. You yeah. can start harvesting on your third year yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and the key, though, you have to think about, you know, and, and there are, those asparagus, asparagus beds last for years and years. But you get viruses and things like that. You should think about uh, if you're really an asparagus aficionado that you're going to start a new bed three or four years after you start the first one, and you're going to do it in a different location, and so that you rotate that so that you keep the production high. And, and of course, the drag with asparagus is the weed management mm -hmm. issues. You know, you can't use simazine anymore because you can't find it, even though I think it's still registered. Patty, vegetables. Do we have any market vegetable producers that ship vegetables in or out of the state that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, but lots of them uh, hit in the farmer's markets. The farmer's market are pretty lucrative, and they've really grown, mm -hmm. uh, and you can get good vegetables there. This state can produce vegetables. We just don't have a big enough market, I don't think. Long history of that. Uh, Bozeman was big in peas. Mm -hmm. And carrots. Yeah. Back, back in the 1920s, we grew carrots and Montana growing carrots. If you let them in the ground until after a good hard frost, there's none better any place in the country. Mm -hmm. They are really sweet. We uh, do, Jack, see some uh, some of the community supported ag, like here in the valley, where there'll be a salad at a local restaurant that's from Montana, product. you know, production. So I mean, it's maybe not be shipping hundreds of miles, but it's probably being shipped 10 or 20 miles and, and available in that way. Okay, thank you. We have lots more callers about pocket gophers and voles. We'll do those in a couple of weeks, so keep watching. Our critter guru uh, really knows how to take care of those things, and we'll get to those at that time. Uh, sagebrush, any idea how to get rid of it? I mean, you're well-versed in all kinds of different things. Well, I'm sure there are products um, registered for that, but I, I don't know which ones they are. I, and, uh, I don't either. Uh, we have a weed scientist on next week, so we'll get to that at that point. And we also have a caller from Livingston 
that wants a product to eliminate cheatgrass, and we do have some new herbicides for that. I'm not going to get into it because it's not time to spray yet, and we have somebody who knows a lot more about mm -hmm. it next week. Uh, from Helena Valley, um, this person wants to become a, a hobby bee farmer. First of all, they want to know how they get the education to become a bee farmer, and number two, where do they get the bees? You're, you're so I keep bees. bees. I keep bees, and so the first thing um, I would tell the uh, um, viewer is to find a mentor. And if you've if you haven't worked bees before, before you make the investment and the time and the money, you should go and uh, and do a hive inspection and make sure that um, you're super intrigued with the whole process of smoking the hive, opening up, extracting the frames. That kind of thing. Um, some of the counties have uh, beekeeping workshops. Um, Lewis and Clark County did have a county agent who was a very active beekeeper. So I would start with your county agent and see if they have any programs coming up. Um, it, you have to plan fairly far in advance because you have to order your bees. So our bees primarily come from um, the Central Valley of California and you buy them as a package. And so literally they come in a shoebox size with um, three pounds of bees and a queen. And um, um, we really encourage new beekeepers to try to set up two hives so that you can compare uh, the rate of, of uh, development between the two colonies. There's that old kind of adage about livestock, right? 25% is great, 25% is not good, and 50% is average. It kind of applies to bees too, so if you happen to get uh, if you only set up one hive and you happen to get kind of a bone package or would be the queen would be um, um, not adequate, you really can't gauge how well your site's doing and your management. And so if there isn't a, a, a locally available beekeeping class, then um, there are some online ones. Our colleagues at U of M have an online multi-step beekeeping program that's pretty good and also our colleagues at the University of Minnesota, uh, since they obviously specialize in beekeeping in northern climates. So those are two, two good places to start. Or then you teach a beekeeping course, don't you, sometimes? Well, I have a, uh, it's part of the topics in horticulture class. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Uh, from Miles City, this person is interested in possibly starting a value-added industry. They'd like to know, does the Extension Center, Manufacturing Center, help secure venture capital in any way or form? Not really. We, uh, we're not qualified to do that. Uh, we can uh, give you a list of the uh, existing venture capitalists in Montana. We can give you a list of uh, other options for funding, uh, but we're just not qualified for that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, this is a comment that came from Big Sandy. Last week we talked about growing continuous wheat uh, or cereal and pulse crops, but this person said with the last three or four years of drought, we're pretty much going back to a fallow system anymore. Are you seeing that too? I certainly heard comments yeah. that, you know, that go in that direction. The drought situation, especially in um, north central Montana, has it's pretty severe, and uh, yeah, people were struggling with uh, having enough soil moisture to grow their crops. Yeah, well, I think you know if if you don't have the soil moisture, mm -hmm. you're forced back to a fallow system, mm -hmm. and I think we've seen that the last three or four years based mm -hmm. on the extreme drought. Uh, Patty <laughs> from Whitehall, I love these kind of questions. If you had a crystal ball, what is something on the manufacturing horizon? Mm -hmm that Montana ag families should look into? Uh, it's fun getting any, these uh, good ones. <laughs> any, any final product that you think your crop is being used for. So I think uh, we talk about the beer industry in Montana. I don't think that, I think the reason that uh, that started in Montana is there was just some people that were really into beer and wanted their own uh, brewery. But some, you know, farmers could have looked at that and said, what is our barley being used for? And did a little research and figured out it's being used for beer. Why don't we make our own beer and cut out the middleman? 
but in the, I, w- I would think, uh, you know, Farver Farms in uh, Scobie's done a great job. They're, they're growing uh, lentils and making a uh, snack cracker out of the lentils. Uh, David Oeen's done a great job at uh, Timeless Foods in, in Ulm, where he's producing uh, a final product there too and of course David or uh, Bob Quinn excuse me oh, yeah. with uh, with his producing uh, the crackling kamut from the crop he grew uh, I think meat products uh, you know I, we, I mentioned 41 grains out of scoby too uh, chickpeas have high protein and that's a great opportunity to to make something out of the high protein Product. Creativity. You yeah. got to think a little bit and find something that fascinates you and then research it yes. and go with it. Um, so one of the questions I would think that you have to ask yourself is how are you going to market this and how are you going to get it there? Mm-hmm. And so we had a small culinary herb greenhouse and that was our biggest challenge. It wasn't necessarily growing it or selling it. It was just it costs so much to ship, and um, yeah, developing new markets was a big, big challenge. I agree with you, David, and I think that's part of your feasibility study is you really have to verify your market, uh, and how far does this type of product travel before it's consumed. That is the reason that many of our ag processing facilities are not located in Montana, is because we don't have enough consumers right here. So it's cheaper to ship grain, to a high population area, mm. make it into bread there, and serve it to the all the people in the area. Shipping costs of the bread mm. being low, right close by. So uh, that has to be a huge consideration when you start a business. Transportation in Montana is becoming more and more of an issue too. I'm told. I would almost say it's getting a little bit better than it has, has it? just yeah. because we're getting more product coming in. You know, for some of these local foods, there's kind of getting to be a critical mass where we have some kind of intermediaries that's willing to pick up, you know, Patty's product and five miles down the road, pick mine up and then bring them to Billings or Bozeman. You know, we're, our regional hubs, as opposed to me as the producer manufacturer having to do all that delivery myself. So, you know, I think there are some, in some areas of the state, I think some things are getting a little bit easier. Good. That's good to know. You know, um, question from Facebook. How can they get rid of corn smut in their garden of sweet corn? And, you know, I haven't seen corn smut in sweet corn for a long time. Me neither. I think it was a varietal thing for the most part. Yeah, you know, honestly, I I think corn smut's super interesting. I'd always be, if you ever have that, can you bring a sample to the diagnostic lab? I kind of want to see it close up and maybe taste it. I hear it's a delicacy it is. In, for some people in some cultures. Uh, but you know what? I'm blanking right now on how to um, get rid of that. Is it is it seed transmitted? Do you know? I'm not sure any, anymore. Yeah. It's been so long since I took introductory yeah. plant path. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have that excuse, I guess, but I'm still blanking on it. So I guess I would suggest um, if you want to follow up with me, um, my phone number, I think, is going to be coming up here. Send me an email, and I'll do my due diligence here and research the answer for you. Okay, thank you. Interesting question from Livingston. They just lost a wood processing facility there. Sure. What do you see as the future? And this call came from Livingston. As for the wood product industry in a state like Montana? I would say it's going to be higher value added wood products. So traditionally Montana, we've produced two by fours and, and the likes. Um, if we can go into a higher value item that the uh, two by fours could be used for or similar, I think we have a great opportunity. We have two companies in Montana doing something called cross laminated uh, timber. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically figure a, a, a breadboard, but eight foot, uh, two by eights laminated to 40 foot two by, two by eights and uh, five layers thick. Okay. And uh, basically like a semi-trailer. Uh, but those are being used for architectural uh, one piece floors, uh, walls. Uh, so anything we do with the wood past the two by four or the dimensional lumber, I think, would be the future. Okay. On that note, digging back in my brain from a few years back, there was a company that tried to start up making 
I won't say wood products, but laminated products out of wheat straw in Conrad area, I believe, or is that never taken off that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't heard of the company. Okay. Well, that's been several years ago. Uh, okay. I have one more question here for um, Joel. And they say baby boomers are basically at the retirement age. Is this pro or con for mo small Montana business? Well, I'd say the first thing is um, your supply of workers is probably going down because baby boomers are, like you said, hitting retirement age. They're leaving the workforce. They're a large generation relative to the next, so the workers coming in is not enough to just ensure numbers to replace them. Um, on the other hand, if you're a business that maybe sells to an aging population, you might have a growing customer base coming True. into there. So probably overall, it's probably a negative. Um, but there are some situations where it could be a, certainly a positive. All what right. is the average retirement age? I mean, is 65 mm -hmm. out the window? Um, you know, 65 is a number that came with sort of Medicaid eligibility, right? Um, all right. We got to cut this off, guys. We're right. running out of time. But anyway, it's been a good session. I enjoyed it. Thanks for all the calls this evening. Next week, Christy Clark with the Montana Department of Agriculture will be with us. If you care to, join us again. Meanwhile, have a great week and avoid these 20 inches of snow. Good night. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.